Welcome to the Impactful Writing Podcast from the Story Geeks and the Reclamation Society. On today's show, we're talking about how to write an amazing end to your story. What makes for an amazing end to stories? That's like a huge question, and we're going to try to tackle that. I'm Jay Shear, co-writer and director of Death of a Bounty Hunter. And with me, as always, is the screenwriter of The Mongolian Connection and comic book writer Caleb Monroe. What, what's up, Caleb? How are you? It's, cra- it's crazy uh, out there. You know, it's crazy out there, but is it really any crazier than usual? I, <laughs> True. I, I'm not sure. I think we just know more about how crazy it is. What if, what if that's the case, right? Like, Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's any more crazy. I just think we're paying more attention. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Exactly right. Well, this will be a good uh, distraction for anybody who is trying to write during this pandemic slash election year slash election week. We're in the middle of election week. Um, You might be listening to this later on the podcast channel, and if you are, then it'll be a lot later, and you will have known what happened, but we actually (laughs) don't know what happened. Um, So, But we're going to talk about storytelling, because that's what we get into on this podcast, and uh, I'm excited about it, because we've been doing a three-week series. We did beginnings of stories. We've talked about the middle of stories with Hannibal Taboo two weeks ago, and now Caleb and I are going to jump into the ending of stories. Uh, so it's just those three things. They, they always tell you you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And now we're at the end of our series and of stories. Um, Caleb, is there anything that you want to throw out there on the table before I start asking questions? Um, well, I'm going to reiterate something that we've talked about before, uh, and that is we are explorers, not experts. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and the reason I'm bringing that up specifically here is because I would say Craft-wise, endings of the three, beginnings, middles, and endings, yeah. endings are probably the area where I need the most work myself, where I need mm. to learn the most, where I need to develop more craft. Um, and so, of course, I will be talking about endings with all the thinking and understanding that I have. But, uh, of course, also sort of, I would say that's not a weak point, but a, a weaker point in, mm. in my work, I think. Interesting. I will say that... For me, when it comes to endings, I'm probably going to be far more controversial than most writing books would tell you <laughs> to be. Uh, it's just some personal feelings I have about about the, the way stories end and, and what we should actually be doing versus what most people actually do. Um, and so, so again, this is just like 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 Caleb just said. These are just uh, we're we're enthusiasts and we're trying to constantly learn more. We're not going to give you definitive answers, but hopefully, what we will do is prompt you to start thinking about these things potentially in different ways than you've thought about them before. Also, with some of the wisdom, I keep pointing over here on the desk. You can't see them, but there's a bunch of books on my desk. Um, the wisdom of other people as well, trying to bring that into our conversations. And we'll see how it goes. The first question I have for us, Caleb, is what is the actual definition? How would you define the ending of a story? In other words, when we talk about this, when we say the ending, um, what are we actually talking about? We've done this with with the last few um, podcasts as well, where we say, let's define what we're talking about before we start talking about it, because definitions matter and people might have different definitions. So we want to be a little bit more specific with what we're doing here. So how would you define the ending? Well, I also have different definitions. I'm going to give you four definitions. Nice. Because as I was thinking through it, none of them quite cover all of it. Right. Uh, But they all cover like an important aspect of it. Um, And the first is just we've been talking about how at the very core, um, a story is problem solving. Someone has a problem and tries to solve it. And so at the very basic level, an ending is a the problem being solved even if the solution is oh there is no solution for this particular problem like but that like having at least reached that conclusion right, right. um uh, and your audience having reached that conclusion not always your characters uh mm. so uh, at a very basic level um the solving part of problem solving <laughs> mm. uh would be an ending um sort of on a more technical level uh i, I referred to this in our last episode i was talking about the Scott Meredith agency and Aldous Budras and the, the idea of try fail cycles as being sort of the middle part of a story. Um, and so I'm going to use their terms for the end too, which is climax. We're all pretty familiar with that. Yeah. And then validation, um, mm. which is the hardest part to define. <laughs> mm. um, and it is, uh, some people call it resolution. I prefer the term validation because people don't use the term resolution consistently. 
So from book to book, some people will use it to describe the climax. Some mm. people will use it to describe the validation. Uh, you know, um, and so I prefer climax and validation because I think that they're just a little bit clearer terms. The water mm -hmm. are less muddied. Yeah. And so, uh, like we were saying, there's these try fail cycles, trying to solve the problem, failing, failing in a way that leads to a new problem or intensifies the problem and more trying has to be involved. And so your climax is essentially your final try. Mm -hmm. And whether it fails or not is the, is, is the result of the climax. Um, mm. And it's usually a success. So it's usually try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, try, succeed. Um, whereas for the villain, it's try, succeed, try, succeed, try, succeed, try, succeed, and then try, fail at the end. Mm. Um, but the validation, this is a little mushier. Um, uh, if you if you see if like a, if an ending leaves you feeling sort of incomplete, then maybe this is what got left out. Um, yeah. uh, and it's 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 basically and, and it and it's I should say this is in Western fiction. I should say almost everything that we're talking about is in Western fiction because story <laughs> structure can be very different in other places. Yeah. Um, but it's essentially it's it's saying to your audience, okay, you can go now. Like you can mm -hmm. leave the room like this. We have reached a conclusion. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the famous example from A New Hope is the metal pinning ceremony. It's not oh, the yeah. blowing up of the Death Star is the climax, but the validation is everybody on a red carpet getting, you know, their medals. Um, and that sort of just gives us that emotional beat of satisfaction. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, OK, everybody, the story's over. Now you can go home. Mm. Um, and, or a wedding is another one that happens often. Mm. Uh, ha they lived happily ever after is right. the validation, you know, <laughs> right, right. cause it's, it's not just the action of the story ends. And then it's, you know, there's this little button that's just like, and they lived happily ever after that's your validation. And that's saying, okay, you can go. Um, uh, and, and sometimes this is not them. This is not a, especially in ongoing things. This is not like a character ultimately solving everything. Mm. Um, a lot of it can also for again for ongoing. This will often be the beginning of them solving something, in in their life. You know, and a wedding is a great example of that. They are beginning a lifetime journey. These two characters, we've we've watched them come up to the wedding, but it's not like their lives end when the wedding ends. Like their lives <laughs> right, begin right. when the wedding. Be, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that so. Climax and validation, the solving part of problem solving. Um, and this is related to climax and validation, but it, uh, it's the emotional release of your audience. Mm. Um, uh, it's just sort of that satisfactory um, thing. And, and then this is tied into what you want your audience to walk away feeling. Mm. Because the, the final emotion that they feel in your film is going to color their memory of the whole thing. Yeah. And so no matter what you've done in the rest of your film, you are choosing at the end what lens they are going to view all of that through. Mm. Um, and so you have to think through, well, okay, so what emotion do I want them to walk out on? What, what if I succeed and they experience that emotion, how will that inform everything that they just saw and make it a better experience? Um, and so this is this is sort of your final emotional exchange with the audience. Um, and then I, I, another way of saying it, I guess, is is sort of you're paying off the spiritual loan that your audience has made to you. Um, uh, every story, I can't remember if I've talked about this before, but I think every story has what I would call a spiritual budget. Mm -hmm. There's a certain amount of themselves that you're asking an audience to spend mm -hmm. uh, on your story. And a, a, a film with a very high spiritual budget is going to have a smaller audience because it's much tougher to watch and to get through and they have to spend a lot. Um, and whereas a, an easier film has a lower spiritual budget, more people are willing to engage because it's, it's not such a huge commitment. And whatever that is, there's not a right or wrong and, and different spiritual budgets are appropriate for different stories. Um, but this is the part where you essentially like sign the thing and say, okay, your loans paid off. Like, thanks. Thanks <laughs> right. for making all your payments. Now you're free. So it's, it's kind of that moment of like, now you own the house. Now you own the car. Like just sort of like you've been doing something you've been spending mm. and now the reward. Um, so those, those kind of muddied together. I started out thinking those were four, but those last three kind of all get 
get jumbled together. But yeah, the solving part of problem solving, climax of validation, the emotional release slash send off of your audience, and then just sort of the the conclusion of the spiritual loan from your audience. Mm, mm. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I am. It's so funny because everybody has their definition of what a story is and how a story works and how a story should function. And that has turned itself into all the books on my table, but also like a lot of thinking in terms of we, we don't tend to think of stories as being, I mean, use the word that you've already used as validated in the real world, not in the story world, in our real world as writers, we tend to not think of the story as being validated unless one of two things has happened. Uh, it, the more academic route is that some one of your peers have told you that it is a excellent story and then you've mm -hmm. validated it and that's great. Like you've done an excellent story because the peers, your peers said you did. The other sense of validation we get is that a bunch of people who are in the collective populace tell us either with their words or more likely with their money that the story is fantastic and we loved it and we we're going to tell our friends that it's awesome. And unfortunately, I think that that does something to, it, it has an impact not only on what we believe stories are, but it also has a pretty big impact on uh, how we then craft them in the future. Because both of those two things have very, um, they have win conditions that set limitations on writers. <laughs> Uh, so you just talked about how do you, how does your, how does your audience feel when they leave the theater? Well, most blockbusters are going to say we need to have the audience feel in such a way, usually, usually good, but sometimes you need to feel like so scared that you want to tell other people how scared you are in the case of like horror movies. But usually it's like, oh, that was a really happy ending. And I need to go tell my friends that this story has such a happy ending and they should go see it because it's so, uh, there's so much goodness there to to participate in and i think this is nowhere more true than it is in hollywood where there's literal yeah. books written about like this is the structure like we've analyzed all the movies and like and pretty soon i'm like well yeah then just have artificial intelligence write all your movies because you're just going to become so formulaic with it which they've tried and and they are awful have you, have you seen have <laughs> yeah. you seen any of those attempts i i've only seen like little like <laughs> snippets on twitter <laughs> that's all i've really seen um but I think that that does a disservice to the act of to the act of storytelling and to people engaging in storytelling. And I'm saying that as a more of a mechanic than a muse. So I'm not one of these people right. that's like just write what you think. Like I'm not one of those people because I do think that that and I know you would say this as well. You need to become a mechanic at some point to make sure that the ideas and the problem that you're working through is communicated in such a way that it's resonating with some audience to some degree. Um, unless you just want to do it for the act of getting stuff on paper, that's fine too. I don't care. But most of us would want to get stories in front of people. And so a lot of people will call it like a resolution. Like you said, like, oh, it's the resolution. And so you have this, the climax and then like resolution. And I personally feel like we do a disservice to the audience to use your terms, which I love when we've asked someone to, give up of their spiritual bank account to invest and engage in this story. Um, I feel like we do them a disservice if we just make them feel like happy. I'm not saying you shouldn't make them feel happy and rosy at the end, but if 90% of the stories that we're telling make you feel that way, then I think we're doing a disservice to, to history, <laughs> to, to, to culture in general, because we're setting up an expectation that may be proven false over the long run in their own lives. Uh, and so I am just going to tell you that <laughs> I think it's just the place where the story stops and it's the place where the story stops and that you choose that. I say that having read all the books. So what I'm not saying is, is like, just go, just go think that like technique doesn't matter. And like the climax doesn't matter and that the resolution doesn't matter. I'm not saying that I'm saying know what all of those things mean. And then when you have your own spiritual journey and you want to end that story, giving the audience their own spiritual journey, go, oh, well, this is where I think this would end to have the most meaningful uh, interaction with my audience and, th and their most meaningful interaction with the real world and how they will experience it. So I'm, I'm, 
I usually I'm very much more of a mechanic and want to say like, this is how it is. But when it came to this point, I was like, you know, we, we, we just really quick, just really quick. I'll just indulge me in this. We did. Have you watched Star Wars Rivals, the, the short film that we made? Yes. Okay. That story ends at a place and we've done screenings of it, multiple screenings of it. And the common reaction in the screenings is that the people will be, will sit there and then a few people will sporadically decide to clap. And a few people are like, am I supposed to clap? Like, I don't understand. Like, this did not end in any of the ways I was expecting it to end. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what you're saying happened here. And that is entirely intentional. Like, that is, like, the purpose of ending it there. The purpose of ending it there was to say, I don't want to do a after-school PSA about verbal abuse and bullying because that has a message to it that will be very blatant and obviously you shouldn't do those things. But what if we just looked at it as if what would happen in what could possibly happen in real life but using Star Wars as a backdrop? And that's sometimes more so how the story ends. Um, and so for me, having done some of those endings where it's like, I just don't know where to go with it from here because I don't want to force something that's not true. Or I also don't want to uh, force something that would glorify um, the ending, right? Like, cause we tend to want to glorify the ending so that everyone feels like every, the problem was solved in a way that was reasonable. Um, mm -hmm. I just go, just end it where you have to end it because you know what it was that you were going into, right? You explored, you tested all of the different things and, and maybe validation does not look like what the audience expects it to look like based on what they've seen before. Yeah, no, it, I mean, ideally, uh, okay, I'm going to save this for some of our, for, I'm going to save what I was about to say for some of our later discussion, uh, but I will say okay. this, uh, I will say this, um, and that is that uh, the, a validation or an ending is usually relational mm. in nature. Uh, and in fact, those examples I mentioned earlier, a wedding, a metal pinning ceremony, happily ever, they lived happily ever after. It's, there's, there's a strong relational component. It's rarely just one person mm. um, on their own. Um, and I think that that mirrors, uh, that mirrors what we were talking about, I think it was last week, how stories release oxytocin in our brains, yes. which is, the hug hormone yeah. so that stories we re, stories are a relational act because we relax react to them neurologically like we're being given a hug yeah. um and so i i think that's because storytelling is a relational act having that relational tone at the end is um is is very common yeah. um and but sometimes the nature of that relationship is you challenging the audience, yeah. yeah, you know, or so what do you think about that? Or, <laughs> right, <top>? exactly. or <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, uh, and all of those are valid. Yeah. It's really, are I mean, I think at the end of the day, are you satisfied? And do you feel like you finished? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I think that because I think when we're talking about beyond technique, which is where this question, well, I guess the next question we're going to go into is beyond technique. But I think that how we define the ending matters, because if we define it as a resolution, then in our minds, as we try and solve this problem, we are going to limit the number of potential solutions or the, the, potential, uh, the potential outcomes relative to the tests, right? Like we have these hypotheses and we have our, our characters are testing them. We're testing them. Our audience is testing them. And at the end we go, sometimes the hypothesis is so uh, diluted by information or diluted by activity or diluted by relationships that you actually cannot disprove or prove it. It is something else entirely. You end up at a different place entirely. And, um, and I think that those kind of stories and those kind of endings are really fun. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I should say though that writers tend to appreciate those endings more yes. than people who don't write, because <laughs> yeah. because we understand the craft involved and we understand we understand what they're doing, playing with conventions, and so we have this other level of appreciation that's mm. that's craft. Um, yeah. 
that people who are just consuming sort of for an emotional experience don't always have that added dimension. Um, yeah. I'll see this. I see this with my wife sometime. I mean, she, she works in film and TV, so she's part of a lot of stories, but the way she thinks about stories is still just different than how I do. Right. Um, and uh, so sometimes an ending will be satisfying to me and not to her or vice versa, <laughs> you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, and to your, so to your point, because this is, this is a really fun, I think this area of this conversation is really fun. And I'm sure we'll get, be getting into some of the other questions as we talk about this, but I don't want to leave it just yet because um, writers do tend to have a different view than, than the general public. And I think we need to understand where our audience is coming from. We also need to understand the medium because in Western cinema, we have sort of divvied ourselves up into two groups of large groups of people. I'm sure there's way more, but I'm just, just for the sake of example, uh, the general populace who goes to see movies, right? I, I remember doing a talk one time. I was doing a talk at a university about uh, heroes and villains and how we see heroes and villains in cinema. Um, and I was using a lot of MCU examples. And one of the things I realized as I started talking is I'm like, oh, so how many people saw, you know, Black Panther or how many people saw, you know, Captain America or whatever. And most of the people in the room were like, I think I saw that. I don't remember. And then of course, like for me as a person who podcasts about this stuff um, for the last four years, I'm like, well, how would you not know if you saw it? Like, like <laughs> I, I'm so intimately familiar with it that I remember it very distinctly. And I think that that's something that you're, you're, so these, these two groups I was talking about are the general population that in large part has been told that you go to the cinema for probably about two reasons. I'm oversimpl oversimplifying, but just go with me. Two reasons. You want to feel something and you also want to probably escape, right? You don't see a lot of Western blockbuster cinema, um, wide release movies, if you will, where the story isn't resolved pretty nicely and it wasn't a lot of escapism <laughs> while, you were, while you were on that journey. Um, and then the other side of that coin is people who are in the storytelling industry, whether it's directors or writers or whoever, people who engage in story who go, actually, I'd rather go see the independent films for the people of, like with different things to say and different opinions on, on how we could tell stories. And those are two pretty divergent groups. And so to your point, like with you and your wife or, or, or with me, my, my wife happens to be an editor who actually has worked with editing a lot of stories. So she and I are usually a lot more on the same page, but that's actually kind of dangerous for me as a writer. Cause my, if my wife reads something that I wrote, she's gonna be like, yeah, it's great. And I'll hand it to somebody else and they'll be like, what are you doing? You know? So, um, so yeah, I think that that's really important to know who you're writing for, but also to, to see if you can, to see if you can make a change and disrupt what is the norm. I love it when people, uh, you know, I think, I think I always bring up Jordan Peele on this podcast. And Jordan Peele is one of those people for me who like, he just, he gets you, you feel very satisfied at the end of his movies, but he just gave you some things that are going to stick with you. And you're going to think about it. And you're like, ah, oh, I can't really resolve that in my head in just that two hours. And I love that kind of thing. Like leave the cinema, leave the movie, leave the comic book, leave the novel reflecting on it. That's fantastic. In my opinion, I love those kind of stories. So escapism for me is not the end goal with stories. And so therefore, I, I appreciate different things. <laughs> yeah, I like the way that Tolkien talked about it. He said, why is escapism a negative term? He's mm. like, when people are in prison, they long to escape. And it's good. <laughs> like, it's right. a good thing. It's a good thing to want to not be in prison. And, mm. and there's so many types of prisons that we encounter or get forced into or face in life. And his point is like, so escapism, is, is there's, it's not a negative term mm. um, unless you're you know, unless you are trying to escape something that it would actually be better for you to not escape. He's like, but a lot of people, yes. you know, find themselves in prisoned by various things, life circumstances or um, emotional issues or uh, uh, relationships or whatever. And they're like, he's like, escape is good. Escape mm. is good. When you're in prison um, and you shouldn't be there, escape is good, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's a good, I think we oftentimes use the term escapism to define like the idea that we would walk away from a story forgetting our problems or, or forgetting what it was that was 
going on in, in regular life, if you will. And that's what I that's what I that's what I always think of. Like, I want the story to be something that makes me think and makes me feel even if it's even if I'm escaping from my normal life. It's not escapism because the story is still meaningful. And so I don't even maybe I should stop using the term escapism and start using the term like, um, uh, well, then I go into my ranting about propaganda, which you've heard a million times. But it's like I don't want to be told that this is just the way things are that reinforces my belief system at every turn. I want to be challenged. I want to be, I want something to come out that is, um, that causes me to go, Oh, I think I need to step into somebody else's shoes for a minute to see this differently. Um, but and ending, wrapping it back into endings, the ending is where then you said this earlier, the ending is so important because it is what they, what everyone leaves with. And so if you leave it wrapped up in a nice bow and they feel nice and they can just go, okay, that's the way that life is. That's one way to end it. But there's also lots of other ways to end it where they go away thinking or feeling and they, and that sticks with them for a while. And uh, I think you're right that writers like those kind of endings more than, more than audiences. But I do think that they're sometimes really good to push audiences in that direction. Yeah. Um, any more thoughts on, any more thoughts on that? Um, are we beyond technique yet? Or are we still defining it? No, I'm, I'm still about to ask the, I'm still about to ask the beyond technique question. Okay. Yeah. Then I, I'm done. I'm done with defining. I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. I think we'll probably define it as we go. Uh, so in this, in this, uh, in this series, we've been going beyond technique, by the way, you, you referenced that, that talk we were having about, um, oh, I forget what it was that you were just talking about that you would reference. It, that was actually four weeks ago. I was just going to tell you that that podcast, oh, the, oxyto was, the oxytocin, the oxytocin one. I just okay. listened to it this morning because I was I was going, and I was like, wow, that was four weeks ago. It does feel like yesterday. So I don't know what's I don't know what's <laughs> up with that, but uh, so so beyond technique is part of this series, and we've been doing this for a number of weeks now. What beyond technique uh, has significance in terms of endings, and so. I'm just going to turn this question over to you. Are there personal, cultural, spiritual, and mental implications to the ending of a story? And if so, what are those? Yeah, um, I think way back in our first talk, uh, I, I, I was saying how I was giving my definitions for narrative and for story mm. and how consciousness in time creates a narrative because there's a sequence of events that mm. are perceived but that the shaping of narrative is what creates story. And I, endings, I would say, are on one hand, the most shaped part of mm. shaped narrative, and also maybe the least shaped part. I, I mean, that's a really clear statement, right? But <laughs> it, like, it's it, the shaping that it takes for a satisfying like moment, like this is over, life rarely has those. Mm. Um, and so that requires an, an intentional shaping on your part to turn something that could just be narrative into story. Mm. But at the same time, life has seasons. Things mm. do come to an end. Jobs, relationships, places where you live, chapters of life. Um, and, and, and so it's also very natural for a story to not be indefinite, for it to reach some sort of conclusion. So you're, I think you're taking sort of a natural tendency of all of life, um, but you are, you're shaping it in a very specific way so that it's not just sort of the slow fade out that a lot of endings are in life, mm -hmm. you know, like the slowly talking to that person less and less because you don't live in the same city anymore or, you know, things like that or the transitions from seasons mm -hmm. uh, in the world. Most, most things do, do end, but they tend to be slower, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so you're, you're, but you're trying to, f to condense all of that natural, naturally occurring cyclical nature of life into, you're trying to shape that into a way that really lands and, mm -hmm. and just is, like I said, emotionally satisfying and gives your audience a lens for what they're looking at, pays off the spiritual budget. Um, but on, on so that's, that's sort of how I think it just works with, with life and the, mm -hmm. and, and the way life works on a bigger level. Um, uh, we've talked about how, uh, you, you know, traditional roles of artists is what's right with the world, what's wrong with the world, how can it get worse and how can it get better? 
Mm -hmm. And different types of stories will fall into different one of those. Mm. But also when you think about how to get worse and how to get better, one of those will prevail. Mm. And, uh, and I personally believe there's a spiritual conclusion to the universe, mm. not necessarily a physical conclusion, you know, but I, I do believe there is a spiritual conclusion to the universe and I do believe it falls on the better side and not the worse side. Mm. Um, and so, in that regard, and this is something else Tolkien coined a term for. He called it the U catastrophe, um, yeah. the the uh, the the wonderful catastrophe, uh, the, the the pleasant violent turn at the end. Um, it, it was his way of trying to explain this is why we tend to go for the happy endings because there actually is a metaphysical structure of the universe that that is bent that way, and mm. we're reflecting it. Mm. Um, and but whether or not that's um, whether or not that's how you see things, you, when you when we think about our job as sort of saying what's right, what's wrong, how it can get worse, how it can get better, we do have to, for the purpose of our story at least, mm. we do have to choose worse or better, um, mm. or at least for elements of the story. Like it could get better for one character, worse for another, you know, things like that. But we do have to pick one usually. Mm. Um, because otherwise it wouldn't be worse and better. It would be the other functions where you're just saying this is good and this is bad. Mm. Worse and better is progress. And so you had to have come to something. Um, so I, I think that's the more metaphysical side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so a, sort of a natural, a natural look at beyond technique, what endings are, why they work and, and what we're trying to do with them. But then also sort of just a, a bigger metaphysical, spiritual, like, uh, perhaps we are reflecting the nature of the universe. Yeah, I think I think that that's really interesting and good because when you talk about beyond technique, like technique does not exist if technique does not exist if principles of the universe do not exist. Does that make sense? Like, like what? How else does technique exist? Like, we just now. Granted, that doesn't that doesn't mean that that technique isn't cyclical, and that as people's opinions and and as time time changes and as time uh, turns a new leaf, so to speak, that doesn't mean that we don't use different techniques because people are tired of the same old techniques or we've we've worn them out on certain techniques. Um, but when you talk about beyond technique, I think that there's, I think that uh, at least for me, I'll just say this for me. Writing is very much this allegorical, like even like a play, what do you call it? Platonic, Plato, Plato. Uh, platonic, I, like a platonic ideal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Where we're looking at the wall of a cave and trying to reflect what it is that, that we feel like how the world would work around us, you know, and, and, and then trying to decide what's real based on what we're, what we see on the walls of the cave. Now that's a really bad metaphor for, for that, um, for Plato's uh, uh, cave metaphor that he uses. But, but I think that, that as a writer, that's, that's, if you, if you're, you might naturally do that. Cause you, cause you see and observe things around you in such a way that you take that back and you kind of reflect them in your writing and you, you, uh, you, that's how, that's the way that you observe is you observe from, um, the scientific method about, okay, I've observed this a number of different times. So that's going to work itself into my story. But I think that there's also a part of writing, even if you do that, where you are still reflecting on the bigger value system that is at play, right? Is uh, why does, um, why do stories work or not work? Sometimes because they reflect what we see on a daily basis, but sometimes too, we actually want to break what we see on a different base, daily basis so that we can actually expand our understanding of what should be. Well, as soon as you ask the question of what should be, then the, then the answer is, well, if it's not something that we see around us that it should be, like, where am I looking to that to, for the answer to that question? And I think that a lot of storytellers will go about that same process. I, obviously, Tolkien did, right? Um, I do it myself. I go, okay, well, well, we've got the um, Death of a Bounty Hunter is coming out on November 9th. And right, what's, what's today? The 6th sixth yeah so we got like just a weekend before it comes out and um before we start releasing audiobook segments and um and that is an exploration of saying it started from a writing prompt in a storytelling contest screenplay writing contest for short films that basically said here's a here's a bible verse 
um, you know, before you leave your alt, before you leave, leave your gift at the altar, before you reconcile yourself to God, go and reconcile yourself to your brother that you have wronged, right? And then, so the question is, like, why would you write that down? Like, is that a principle that we should follow? Is it not a principle that we should follow? What happens when you do follow it? What happens when you don't follow it? This is what this is where you take narratives that you may see and you explore them to try and shape them into something as you as you were talking about earlier and um you know i think that so so beyond technique i think you're you're 100 right like there's some way that this universe is moving there's some way uh and i think that i think i'm gonna throw something else out at you that let's just see if this this resonates at all because this is completely theoretical if we look back in time we tend to see that there were more tragedies that were, well, I shouldn't say I wasn't living in those times, but seemed to be more popular to the time. So Shakespeare was fairly popular. He had a lot of tragedies that he wrote. He obviously had comedies too. Um, but as you think about like Grimm's fairy tales, a bunch of those are just super tragic, right? And it, and it is, it makes me wonder if we get into cycles of human behavior where, like right now, I would tell you that almost no news is released to the general population in Western cultures, specifically in America, without it being a narrative with some sort of <laughs> shaping. Um, we, 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 whether it's pundits that you watch on the news, whether it's uh, conspiracy theories that you see because of what's going on politically, we see narratives that are shaped all the time. Uh, and, and it's and they always are the brain asks the question why and when we don't find a good why we look for all kinds of whys and then we shape those into a narrative and I'm, I'm almost wondering if part of the reason i feel a pull to start to tell more stories that end in tragedy or more stories that go in a different way than the audience might expect is because i see too many narratives being shaped in ways that make it very convenient for the people telling those those stories and, the, and shaping those narratives to get the answer that they want, as opposed to the answer that may be more true to them. And as I look at something like Grimm's fairy tales, or if I look at something like Shakespeare, I go, we didn't used to always do this. The stories used to be a little bit to the point where, where we would see these end in different ways. So I don't know. What do you think? Is that, am I going down the wrong path here? Uh, I, I don't think you're going down the wrong path. I, I have thought over the past decade or so, I have thought that I think one of the important roles of artists in the 21st century, and that is just a really, that's a highfalutin beginning of a sentence. Right? <laughs> right, um, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the US at least, we, have, we seem to be losing or to have lost the ability to sit with difficulty. Mm. You know, um, we, we have to find solutions. We have to find solutions now. And uh, when we don't agree on what the solutions are, you know what I mean? Like there's trouble because this must be solved. We, like, we just aren't very good at sitting with difficulty. And many things in life are difficult in a way that won't go away. And um, so I think an important role of, of storytelling and art in the 21st century, or, or at least in the part of it that we're in right now, is going to be the preservation and probably reinvention of a a grammar of grief or a, mm -hmm. a language of lament um, to give people categories for sitting with difficulty because mm -hmm. um, uh, they're not getting that story they're not getting that uh, on social media just sort of just the like oh this is difficult and it may take 10 years and you're just gonna have to sit with this this is mm -hmm. something that has to be the only way out is through um, and there's so many difficulties in life that are like that. And I think that we are losing our ability to be able to talk about it. Like we're losing mm. our categories. I think people used to have a lot more categories for um, for sitting with difficulty. Mm. And and I think one of the one of the major factors in the shift is that people don't die at home anymore. Mm. And that's a recent that's a 20th century, mid 20th century development. It mm. used to be that you would die at home. Your whole family watched you die. They heard your final breath and then they had to do something with your body, which was there in the house. Um, but now we have sort of put, we've put death uh, under fluorescent lights behind white doors. No one sees it. No mm. one um, uh, interfaces with it in mm. that same way. 
um, that, so it feels unnatural and not natural. Mm. Um, and I think that was actually, that's actually a big shift. And when we started not, we started forgetting how to sort of sit through difficulty is when we just didn't, we didn't watch our family members die at home anymore. Mm. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's, maybe I'm just, I'm making too big a conclusion there, but I think about that. I think about that. I do too. I think about it a lot. And you, you, I think you and I probably approach it a little differently um, based on our personalities and things like that. Cause I, I always approach it from a standpoint of saying, um, and it was very instrumental for me to, I'll I'll preface what I'm going to say by saying it was very instrumental for me to be in the hospice facility which is still not at home and but to actually observe my mom pass away in 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 2012 because i had a lot of false narratives about what would happen you talk to so many christians predominantly in the modern day and they will tell you these narratives about like well my family member it's just everything was peaceful in the room and like you know if they looked at me like it looked like they were seeing jesus and then they left you know and you're just kind of like Okay, well, when my mom died, it was absolutely horrific and she had brain cancer and there was nothing satisfactory about it for me. And that lament that I carry with me is now I turn it into like, I love the fact that you're very introspective about it because I think that you will um, you will in your stories get to truth through the introspective nature in which you are thinking about these things. I almost take it as more of a challenge of like, show people that this sucks. You know, like, like I was just go to straight to like doing the thing as opposed to reflecting on the thing, uh, which, which just says a lot about me as a writer, but probably me as a human too. Um, and, I, and I think that, that you're right on because I mean, even just look at, let me give you a couple more examples. We have a, a huge drug ep- epidemic. Well, if you're, if all of our stories are telling us that life is supposed to have a happy ending, and, and our lives do not look like they're ever going to have a happy ending. Drugs is a thing that you would turn to. Um, I look at just the, 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 the worship we do in the church. In the American church, don't get me started about this because I have a lot of feelings about this too. Um, but in the American church, we, we have a lot of songs where my wife and I go, we'll go and listen to the songs. And my wife and I hadn't been attending a church for, for a few years now. We, we found one that we are going to now. And I'm observing the worship and I'm going, it's all to try and soothe me from the bad week that I had. I mean, not all of it, but a lot of it is like contemporary worship is for that. But if you go back into the hymns, when you read the hymns, you're just like, I am left devastated. And the only thing left for me to say is it is well with my soul because at least I have something with God that, that will save me from this place. And, and I, I think that, so I think you're onto something. I think that you, we lack the language we lack the ability to sit with things um and i think that i'm 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 hopeful that 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 will work itself into our storytelling because everybody's just trying to solve every problem in the moment mostly with memes on (laughs) facebook (laughs) but 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 the reality is we should probably sit with this longer we come up with better solutions probably too yes I, I think an argument can made be made for memes as being short little hymns of various types. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but I, I like that you mentioned it as well with my soul because it, uh, for if you're not familiar with the story, just go Google the story of how that song got written. Because yeah. regardless regardless of the conclusion the the song reaches and and whether you agree with it, it's just really interesting because the author wrote that song as the response to his wife and all his children dying. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and he wrote a song called It Is Well With My Soul. And it's not a, despite what the title makes it feel like, it's not a happy song. <laughs> it, like that is how he concludes each refrain, but yeah. it's a rough road to that, to that statement each time. Um, and I think that that's just, a, that's just a, a good example to look at, a narrative example of, of, of giving categories and languages for sitting with grief or, or, or lament. Um, and I should also say, um, cause I talked about how, uh, sort of the metaphysical side of stories reflecting pattern, the, mm. the pattern of the shape of the universe. Um, and, and I should say that there's a lot of metaphysics out there, right? And for some people, the metaphysic is there is no shape. We are pattern finding creatures, but all the patterns that we find are false positives. Right. It's, it's random. Right. And that is okay. It, like that is okay. If for that to be your, your, of course it's okay. But like, if, if that's your metaphysic, 
that's great. But whether you have a metaphysic like I do, that the that there is a spiritual conclusion or a spiritual shape to the universe, or you think it's randomness and sort of we're getting false positives um, because we're pattern finding creatures. Uh, I think what is important and what I don't see a lot of writers do, mm. and I always find myself wanting to ask them this when I'm in conversation with other writers, is, well, what do you believe about the universe? Yeah. What Because whatever that is, then what is your answer to why is why is it worth spending time telling stories within that? <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. like totally. If, if I believe this is the nature of existence, why is it worth me doing this? Right. Um, a- am I creating meaning or am I connecting to meaning that's already there or is it something else? Am I just making money? Am I, am I doing it as a way to try to understand things? There's a lot of answers to that question. Yeah. Um, and, and your answers will probably change over the course of your life. But I don't think enough of us ask ourselves that question, yeah. you know? Um, so uh, the way that I phrase it for myself is given everything that I believe about the universe. Yeah the spiritual nature of the universe, given all of that, if all of that is true, then what does that mean when I'm trying to write the next best sentence to describe Batman punching a guy in an alley? (laughs) (laughs) Because if I believe all of that is true about the nature of existence, then there is a connection somehow to me trying Mm -hmm. to figure out what the next best sentence is to describe Mm -hmm. Batman punching somebody in an alley. And uh, I think it's, I think we all need to think about that. I think it makes us better storytellers. Um, And for some of us, it will actually maybe bring us to the conclusion, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to be a writer. Um, (laughs) Or for some of us who do it, you know, just for personal pleasure, it it may bring us to a conclusion of like, oh, no, I want to share this with the world. Like, there's a lot of, I think that we just, we don't um, assess ourselves very well Mm. as far as why we're doing this. Um, You know, like at the bottom of it, I meet a lot of people here in LA and I'm like, I'm like, your why is you're trying to prove something to your parents. Uh, like, that's not a great why for telling stories. Um, it, you know, right. that's a, that, you know, it's a decent enough why for moving to LA and trying to be a success. But for actually telling stories, you need a why that's beyond just wanting to prove something to someone. Um, and uh, and I just don't think a lot of people, writers spend time thinking about that. Um, and so I would yeah. encourage people to do so. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting how... Uh, I'll say this before we jump into technique. I'll say, I think that that's a really wise thing to offer writers or storytellers of any kind to think about is why are you doing the next thing? Because you said it matters what comes after what the next sentence that comes into this story matters because of my spiritual perspective on this particular issue. It matters whether or not that spiritual perspective is coming from a Christ follower's word worldview, a Buddhist worldview, a uh, 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 atheist worldview, um, insert your worldview. It matters because every single sentence of the story will be tested against that by your audience to see if it's true. And some people will, will believe it's true. Some people will not believe it's true. Um, but it will be tested by you yourself. And you you should not reach the end of a story. Speaking of endings, you should not reach the end of your story and be like, I don't feel like this is actually how it would go at all. Because that at that point, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? <laughs> right? Like if you get to the end of your story and you're and and all the conclusions that you've come to do, are not equitable with the worldview that you have been testing this whole time. And this is why I think it's so dangerous for us to just to take off the the testing of the worldview hat and just assume that we're going to write a message out. Because when you write a message out, it will just reflect whatever you think is right as opposed to what you can work out to be right. Um, In other words, you have you're not looking at the, the shadows of Plato's cave on the wall. You've actually drawn things on the wall yourself and said, that's true no matter what. So I'm going to write to that. Um, and you're not testing. You're not testing it to see if anything else could be true. And that to me is um, that to me is a uh, is a giant problem. I, I would I would hate to be in that position. I've had people challenge me. Usually it's Christ followers because of the content of my stories. Um, and they say, like, what about this? What about this? And my answer is always like, well, theologically speaking, this is where I'm coming from. And theologically speaking, I can back this up. Now, there have been a couple of times where I've said, oh, you're, that's probably true. 
that minor, the well, what I consider to be a minor theological issue is maybe I didn't cover that perfectly right in that story. And I don't expect to be perfect in any of the stories that I write. Um, but I do find that interesting is that like, as writers, we can challenge ourselves to write better stories because we can challenge each other's worldviews in some way, shape or form, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah. And, and I think there's a, there's a strong degree to which if someone is coming to you and saying, yeah, but what about that? Uh, you've succeeded. Yes. yes. Because they're, they're, they are thinking about it. And even if you feel like you gave a facile answer, like, you know what, I feel like I, pro I just skated past that. <laughs> right. But the fact that they are thinking about it yeah. actually does mean I have made, at least in that regard, a success out of, out of that thing. I hope that I can do a better job with it next time, but I have still provoked conversation or, or thoughts or introspection or, 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 or just argumentativeness. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and do you have a hard stop at three o'clock? No. Okay. So we'll go a little over because we just got two questions left, but we'll jump into technique now. I think hopefully this is good content for people. If you're out there and you're a writer and you're thinking about these things or, or you're even wondering like, why am I having such a hard time with this ending? Hopefully you can go back to some of the things that we've talked about and that will like prompt you to think differently about the endings. I know it has with me as I've talked to other writers in the past. So getting into technique, do audiences have expectations for how stories will end? We've talked a lot about this already. And are there specific techniques that writers should use to elicit emotion or different thought patterns for their audiences? Um, what's the general wisdom about technique that goes into ending a story? Um, so this is, it's both. So the first thing I'm going to say, it sounds really glib, um, but it's not. Uh, and that is that your ending needs to be surprising yet inevitable. And, and I think yeah. that particular set of words came out of the Buffy writer's room, I believe. Oh. I, I've, I've heard that in the mouths of former Buffy writers multiple times. <laughs> um, surprising yet inevitable. And I know that that sounds glib um, and paradoxical, but I don't, I don't know how to say this any better, but if you're a writer, this is your job. This is it. This is the whole job description to give something people something new, but something that feels like it should exist. Mm. Um, and so surprising and yet inevitable like this, mm. you, you want the story to feel like it could not have gone another way, but also you want the audience to have been like, wow, I was not expecting that. <laughs> and, right. and it's not easy. Um, and uh, is, it, it is not easy at all, but it is, it is literally your job. That mm. is the job of being a writer. Um, mm. It's not putting words on a page. It's not putting together a beautiful sentence. It's giving something, people something that's surprising yet inevitable. Mm. Um, and so uh, that's sort of the big, <laughs> uh, maybe that should have been in Beyond Technique. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> uh, but then the two other very practical things is when I'm about 90% of the way through a story, I go back to the beginning and I read the story and I look for anything that I planted intentionally or unintentionally. Sometimes I'm like subconsciously, mm. I'm like, oh, I left something there. That's a gem. Mm. Uh, I read through it and I just make a list of everything that needs to be brought to its conclusion in these final 10 pages or these final 15 pages. Um, and then starting with that list and with how I already was planning on the story to go, I sort of re outline the end to mm. make sure that it, that everything is 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 tied up or left open on purpose. Mm. If it's left open, that's fine, as long as I'm doing it on purpose. <laughs> you know <laughs> right. what I mean? Um, and 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 sometimes you, and for for comics, for example. Um, and I think I heard this phrase from Grant Morrison, comic book writer, uh, but he was talking about rough edges. Mm. He's like, when you're writing an ongoing series, I think at the time he was writing Batman. Uh, he's like, part of your job is to leave little rough edges mm. that future writers can hook stories onto mm. because Batman is an ongoing story and it, it does, you know, like it keeps going. He's been alive. He's alive before us and he'll be alive after us. You know, like he, <laughs> right. Batman ex exists in a way he's more real than us in some ways and less real in others, but you, you are leaving hooks um, and just little rough edges. Mm. Now they can't, I think the trick is that they can't be, un they can't make the story you're telling currently unsatisfactory. Right. Like, 
but it has to be just like a little something just sort of like it's that someone later can be like, Oh, you know what? I can turn that into six issues. That'll be really interesting. And, mm. um, uh, it, it was a little hook like that in a, in like a, in a Martian Manhunter comic from, I think the fifties or sixties hmm. is what I created my bat villain from when I, oh, when awesome. I, when I was right, I, I wrote a Batman story for DC. They let me create my own bat villain, but that's, that's the sort of thing is I found this one little hook and somewhere, you know, deep in the archives and, and was able to build a story and a character off of that. So it doesn't quite work the same with movies. I mean, if you're doing MCU or if you're doing a series uh, in TV, it does work. Um, yeah. Uh, just so you can leave rough edges, hmm. uh, but you just look for everything that just needs to be tied up. Um, hmm. Because usually by the time you, you know, if, if it's a screenplay and I'm 90% of the way through it, that means I've probably been writing for three or four weeks. Mm. And I'm not going to remember what I was thinking on Tuesday of the first week. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. um, it, even if I made a note about it, who knows if I like my notes are probably many pages long at this point and I'm not looking at that page anymore. And I would have to go back through all of it. It's easier to go back through the story itself um, because in my notes will have lots of things in them that never made it into the pages. Mm. And so then it, you get sort of lost in this cloud of, of maybes. But if I go through the story as written, I'm like, okay, well, here's what I actually put in there. You know, mm. here's what actually needs a payoff um, for it to work. So that's one is I just the final read through. And I like to do it before writing the ending. Mm. Um, and then there's another one, which is once you've written the ending, um, going back through the script, I call this like a backwards polish, I guess. Um, mm. And uh, it's, and basically making sure that everything that you're paying off at the end has been set up the best way possible. Oh. So you read through the script once and you're like, okay, I need to pay that off. I need to pay that off. Now you're going back having written the ending and you're saying, okay, is this, I know I set this up here, but is this the best possible setup to lead mm. to that conclusion? Um, those are two, I think, just very practical ways to approach endings. Um, there's a, when I worked for, uh, I was an assistant for Zach Helms, the screenwriter, director, and he, he I asked him if he had any books on, on writing that he recommended. And mm. he recommended this book called Backwards and Forwards. Mm. Um, and I don't know the author's name off the top of my head, but it's backwards and forwards with an S on the end because that's, it's the British <laughs> use of the terms, not the, not the U.S. use. But it was, it's a book on how to play written by like a drama professor. Hmm. And he's talking about, he's like, read the play backwards um, because that's, that's how you'll catch the, the structural stuff that we, that, we miss, that we miss due to just sort of momentum, hmm. um, you know, things like that. And, um, but, you know, Zach's like, he's like, but I think this is really a great way to approach a script. Um, hmm. Um, and so, yeah, maybe, maybe get that book, but if nothing else, just, just think about doing that final read through before you write the end, make sure you've got all found all your hooks and your open, um, endings, uh, and things that need to be paid off and, and things that you subconsciously planted and didn't even realize were in there. And then also, um, oh, and also like lines of dialogue. It's like, you know what, if I said that line of dialogue in my final scene, if I repeated it it will have such a different meaning. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, that, that's a serious emotional payoff. Often you'll see that's a very powerful technique to see a line get repeated, but it, now it, its meaning is so changed. Mm. Um, and then also doing what I, what I call the backwards polish. Yeah. I love that. I love those two things. In fact, it makes me think of a couple different examples. I don't know why these specific examples popped into my head. Um, but well, actually, before I get to the examples, let me just say that uh, Carl Iglesias in his book, Writing for Emotional Impact, um, which is a good book. I like it. It's, I recommend it. Um, he says that the, the, um, the concept of your story should be uniquely familiar, which is the uh, dichotomy that you talked about and what you offered for the ending. Um, uniquely familiar and promise conflict. And that uniquely familiar part, when you start to unpack that, it's very similar to what you're talking about with it being um, surprising and yet inevitable, right? Like, so what your story promises is something that looks familiar to me, but I've never seen it before. It's just familiar. And then also the, when you conclude your story, it is surprising and yet 
everything that you've done previously makes it inevitable. And I think that that works really, really well. Um, if it was the Buffy writers that, <laughs> that said that, that came up with that, then I, I'm, I'm on board. Um, I think it's really cool. Uh, two, two stories that I think fit that bill um, really, really well are Joker. I know that there's a lot of strong opinions about Joker. Um, I don't love the film myself. However, I understand why the film is so well respected um, because if they did not walk the fine line that they walked between they never really glorify what he does. They never really condemn what he does. They just walk towards the inevitable, which is also shocking especially given what you know about the Joker. And I think that, that, that if, 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 you, if you did not walk that line, there are certain stories where if you don't walk the line perfectly, a lot of stories fit this bill, but your ending will, will be completely unsatisfactory because you will try to force something at the last minute. You'll try to force a direction that your audience will go like, where are you going with that? Or if you hinted too much that you were going to go this way and then you go this way, it just feels like a bait and switch. And so this this walking the line of like, you, if you don't walk the line, you either won't be surprised or it won't be inevitable, right? Like you you won't find one of those two endings. And so Joker sort of fits that bill for me. And the other one, these are both kind of tragic endings, which is I've been saying that Hollywood never does. And here's examples of them. Um, the other one uh, is Chinatown, which is sort of shocking at the ending, surprising at the ending, and yet also sort of inevitable. So... I, I really like that a lot. I, I don't know that I have any great ideas besides what you've already said for technique because I do think that that obviously the climax is really, really important. I would love to see a story that where it wasn't important. That'd be awesome if, it, if somebody was able to create a narrative where the climax wasn't important. But um, I mean, I guess you could say like Dunkirk where technically the climax has sort of already happened and he's just doing a third act type of a resolution type deal. But um yeah, I think that you're. I think that you're right on. So I don't think I have <laughs> anything to add from a technique perspective. I just hope that people will use different techniques than what are in the books. That's but that's my biggest thing is like read the books because the books are awesome, and then go. What if I were to try to break this rule in whatever way possible? Like that, I think is again we're writers, so we like that kind of stuff. But I like that mm -hmm. kind of stuff a lot. Um, yeah. Anything else? Any other any other movies or TV shows or comics that you throw out that they they've done they really accomplished that surprising yet inevitable? Um, you know, I last week I watched I rewatched I should say Haywire, hmm. um, directed by Steven Soderbergh with starring Gina Carano, um, yeah. and I just I love that ending, um, and it's so simple, and yet inevitable and yet it's kind of surprises you um great example and i won't say more than that because if you haven't watched the movie you should and if you've seen the movie go rewatch it because it holds up it's like it's just a really enjoyable experience i'm gonna have to watch it i i, I it makes me think of like I, i'm just sort of going through other endings now but like guardians of the galaxy right where it's like the end battle is actually a dance-off and you're like that's really surprising because i did not expect to see a dance-off but the, the movie began with star lord dancing i mean maybe not began but like that's part of the, the credit sequence is him dancing and so it's inevitable that he would do something like that because it's true to his character and yet surprising it's still surprising mm -hmm. right um yeah so I, I i think that that's a really good way of a really a really good way of classifying that sort of that sort of ending the other uh i really i heard a really funny story from a comedian um have you you've seen sixth sense i assume yes yeah i'm going to spoil sixth sense you should have seen it already. It's tw over 20 years old. Go watch it if you haven't seen it. But uh, Bill Burr has a joke <laughs> where he goes, he's talking about how wives often will give their husbands the silent treatment. And then he goes, the only reason that the sixth sense works is because we're all watching the movie thinking it's more reasonable for this guy's wife to never talk to him <laughs> than it is for him to be a ghost. And that's, that's the whole <laughs> surprise at the end, right? And I thought that was a really funny joke, but it, but it, it it it's it's a it's a humorous way of dissecting what we just took to be as the audience part of how that story was playing itself out. And at the end, 
surprise yet inevitable how is there any other answer to that you know like so i, I love that i think that's a great that's a great definition um, and, and it should be said that that on a on a technique side again when we talk about surprise what surprise looks like when you were putting words on the page is playing with your audience's expectations mm. um so you need to learn the the types of ways that the human brain like will gloss over things or will <laughs> yeah. elide things because this is how you are able to surprise them. And yet they, they think back and they're like, Oh, it was all there. Exactly. Um, and uh, uh, one example I learned from, from two really experienced writers and they've both done a lot of work in the sort of crime and mystery area. Mm. And I think there's even a rule for this. Like a, mm. there's a name for this rule. I just can't remember what it is. It's named after an author to whoever she is. I, I apologize. But if you have a list of things, um, the, what we tend to notice are the first three and the last. Our brain will actually kind of gloss over the fourth or fifth thing in a list of six things. Mm. And so detective writers, mystery writers know this. They know that's how the human brain works. And so they will often plant the, the clue as the fourth or fifth thing in a list mm. um, because our then it's there and we know we saw it but at the same time our brain doesn't really register it and so it's still able to catch us by surprise later that's just one very small technical example um, mm. but uh, the, you, the, you will get better at surprise the more you understand just what people expect and what they're not going to notice and I think the main way to to learn that, I mean, you could, I guess, get a book on um, mental models and 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 the the quirkies, the quirkiness of the human brain. But I think the the best way to learn it is any, every time a story surprises you, mm. to reverse engineer that and say, well, what was I assuming that they that they violated? Like, what was my mm. expectation that got violated in a way that I found that to be a pleasant surprise? And then look at how they did it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. And I think too, like, like when you talk about surprise, one of the ways as a writer in a technique through a technique is to understand where the audience, where the large part of your audience, because obviously you can't surprise every single person, right? There's going to be some people that predict what it is that you're going to do, but for the, for the general audience that you're aiming for, where do they find themselves at? And it's, it's sort of what you just said is sort of the most true way of assessing that problem. And that is they should tell you right before they read the ending that they don't know where it's going to go. And then when they look back and reflect back on after they've seen the ending, they should find all of the reasons why it makes sense that it ended that way. Um, and so that's that's this delicate balance you're playing the entire time because if you if you and that's why I talk about the, the line the walking the line as a writer is that if you go too far one way you've just you've just told people what you're going to do if you go too far the other way um, then they look back through your story and they're like there's no evidence that the story should have ever ended this way um, and you have to have both in there because the brain will not be satisfied unless it can look back reflect back and go oh I see all the reasons why those why that happened or why that played out the way that it did. Um, and I think that that's, I think that's really great. If you can, if your ending can be a surprise, uh, and yet also be inevitable, that's like an awesome ending. So very cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Last question and we'll be done. We'll be done with the podcast. Uh, when a writer gets to the end of a story, now we're gonna talk about the writer's journey. We talked a little bit about that already in terms of reflecting our, our worldview and questioning our worldview. But when we talk about a writer getting to the end of a story, what sort of self-care or self-awareness is important when you reach the end of the thing that you're creating? Um, so I'm going to, I'm expand on these, but I, I think that the two main things that you're going to be interacting with when you end up and get to the end of a story is uh, your emotions and then your momentum. Hmm. Um, and so you're going, when you finish a story, any story, whether, whether you like the result or you dislike the result or what, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and I've talked before how, how you feel as you're doing it actually does not reflect the quality of it at all. Mm. Uh, I've come to learn. Um, but you're going to be feeling an emotional soup. And I, I broke this out into five emotions. Um, mm. You're going to be feeling satisfaction. 
Um, and, and in that, I mean, like job completed. Like I set out to do this thing and I just put finished. Mm. Like that is satisfying. Um, I, I wrote, whether it's a short story or a screenplay or a comic script or whatever it is that you're writing, I wanted to write this thing and then I did. Mm. Um, and, and that's no small emotion because most people have a story they want to tell that they've written 20 pages of and, and nothing else. You know what I mean? Right. Setting out to tell a story and finishing, you should be satisfied. Um, yeah. You should feel like, yes, I did it. I, I accomplished this thing. Uh, so satisfaction or accomplishment might even be a more accurate. Um, you're also going to be feeling relief mm. um, because it's, it's not, it hasn't been an easy process and you're going to be glad it's over. Um, uh, particularly because as we were talking last week, it's, it's towards the end of your story that is the most emotionally fraught for you as the storyteller. And so that's why part of why it feels so good to write the ending um, mm. is because you're, you're putting to bed all of that difficult emotional slog that you just went through, you know? <laughs> right. So you'll be feeling relief. Um, you will also probably be feeling pride. Mm. Um, and this is not quite the same as accomplishment or satisfaction. This is like, just, I finished it, but it's like, you know what? Are you good? You know what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> right, right, right. like I'm not gonna throw it in the trash right now. Like I, <laughs> I finished it and you know what? Maybe I have to rewrite it. I, I see flaws with it, but you know what? It's, it still deserves to exist. And so that sort of pride of creation, um, mm. uh, and, or, or just of craft, like, you know, I did it. Mm. Um, but mm. now that I've done it, you know what? I like it. That's the sort of, that's the pride part. Um, there's going to be grief because especially, especially if you're doing a novel or a screenplay or a comic series, mm. something that's long form, it's been a part of your life for quite a while at this point. Mm. And anytime something that's a major part of our life leaves our life, grief is, is the emotion that we use to describe how that is processed. Mm -hmm. um, and that is why people can grieve when they move. They can yeah. grieve when they lose a job. It's not just when you lose a person, but all of those are examples of something that has been a major part of your life has gone mm. and your life looks different. And you will experience that at the end of your story. It has been something that is, it's a presence in your life and now it's gone. So you will mm. be, you will grieve it. Um, and then finally would be, um, I guess, victorious. Mm. Um, and that is, it's, it's not just, this is a little different than like I completed it and it's mm -hmm. a little different than I liked it. These are all mm -hmm. very subtle, but I do think yeah. that they're, distinct this is the sort of uh triumph mm. like i am a conqueror i won mm. it's it's not that i'm done it's i'm because i'm not just done although that does come with an emotion mm. but it's just like this was not easy i but i battled this dragon and i yeah. won um and so satis yeah so satisfaction or accomplishment relief pride grief and victory um whenever i finish something i actually I go to the bakery a block from here and I get a cupcake of victory. And <laughs> I like, I, I do that as a physical ritual to just sort of to take a minute to be victorious. Mm. Um, because we're, we are not that great as a culture at celebrating. Right. Like we're good at pursuing. Yeah. But we tend to not, when we get there, we tend to not take time to celebrate that we have. Yeah. Um, cause we want to pursue something else. Yeah. Um, and so I would say I, it's a good idea to have a ritual like that. It doesn't have to be a cupcake. Um, although I will say a cupcake of victory is a very satisfying victory. ritual. But, <laughs> um, whatever that is like, take, take a minute to be satisfied, to be proud, to feel victorious and to celebrate the fact that you've done it, mm. you know, go out to dinner, um, or, uh, whatever that looks like for you. Mm. Um, so that's the emotional soup. You're going to, and so, these are these, some of these interact in a way that can make us feel guilty, mm. which will give us a whole other emotion. Uh, like we might feel guilty that we're relieved it's over. Yeah. Um, uh, or we might feel guilty that we are proud of this thing and yet we're grieving it. Mm. Like, like I'm grieving. So how can I also feel good? 
you know? Right, right, right. Um, so these will create, these will create, so I guess that's a sixth one is, is you'll be, you'll be feeling some guilt in, in the way that those, <laughs> those, that, that soup sort of, and sometimes, you know, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Yeah. Uh, I still experience all of these, but because I know that they're coming, um, mm. uh, I, I, I can go, th- I go through them in sort of like a 10 minute, like, ah, you know, and then it's, <laughs> right. and, and, but, it, but, um, but that is, you have to learn just like with any, any emotional process, you have to learn how to process your emotions and you will find that some stories are really going to hit you on one of these. Mm. Like I'm really grieving this story mm. or I'm really relieved this one is over yeah. or I feel really proud. Um, uh, but it's going to be a soup. They're all mixed together. I, mm. I, don't, I don't think I've ever finished a story where I wasn't feeling a version of all of those. Um, yeah. So I think that's part of what we need to understand is just that you will have mixed emotions. Um, and that's normal and to be expected and human and um, enjoy the positive ones and know why the negative ones are there. Um, and that even the negative ones reflect some positivity. You're grieving something because it was a part of your life. And it's like, that was not bad. It was not bad for this to, thing to live with you because mm. um, you this is what you wanted to do. Mm. Um, uh, it's not bad to be relieved either because you sh- like you exerted, you just finished a marathon. Like, it's okay to be like, I'm so glad I can stop running. <laughs> yeah. Totally. You know, but yeah, just, just, so just know all of those are going to be going on in some version or the other. And, and most of us probably have one that we tend to yeah, because, because of our, the way we were raised or our family of origin or our personal proclivities and coping mechanisms or whatever, there'll be one of those that it's like, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really into the guilt you know, or I'm really, really into the victory or whatever it is. Um, so that's the emotional side. And then the other side is the momentum side. Mm. And I think this is actually, this is a dangerous area to be mm. as a writer. And I've talked about this before that I think, I think it's, it's more important to teach writers how to keep the, their momentum than it is to teach them craft. Yeah, yeah, you have talked about this. Yeah. Because if they can keep up their momentum and be writing every day, the craft will come. Right. Because you learn craft by doing, um, but if you if you write and then you stop and then you come back two months later and you write and then you stop, um, y- your craft suffers. You know you haven't you haven't become a two months better writer. You've become a one day better writer two months later. Um, mm. You know, and so I think momentum is so key to the writing life. Um, and you know, and I even have a little chart and it's, I put a red X or a green check if I wrote that day or if I didn't, you know, um, and it just helps me when I see three green checks in a row, I'm like, it just feels good because I know like I'm, I'm, I'm growing, I'm doing, I know that pages are being accomplished. Words are getting put on the page. Things are being done. But if I stop, all of that goes away. Mm. Even if I stop for two, three days, I have to start completely uh, if I'm writing two days in a row, the second day is easier because I'm going off the momentum of the day before. And the third day is easier and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. But if I stop, even for one day, it's back to square one. You're starting over with your momentum. And so this can be a dangerous part for writers in that like you've been working on this thing for three months. You feel so good and you just want to like collapse. But if you do that, you will lose your momentum. Um, mm which affects things like your growth and craft as a writer. And, um, and it will make it that much harder to start the next project. Mm. Um, and so that's why some people finish one story and then do another one. Mm. Um, things like that. So I would say that the same day that you finish your story or immediately the, or the next day, as long as there's that still day after day after day momentum, start your next story. And, yeah. and it can be very small. It can be like, sometimes I put the title and, and my name and the first sentence, but <laughs> I've begun it. You know what I mean? And maybe, and sometimes that's all my brain can handle because it was so hard to finish the last story, but just do it. Do, do two sentences, start an outline, just whatever it is, begin the next one so that you don't, because you have, you don't have any more momentum ever than that moment of victory when you have just typed to the end on something else. Mm. That is the, that is the height of momentum that you'll have at any point. Mm. And so 
take advantage of that and let it be the, what launches you into your next project. Mm -hmm. And then it just becomes so much easier just to, it's like, oh, now I've got two things done. Now I've got three things done. If you use the, pre, the conclusion of the previous one to launch yourself into the next one. Um, and, um, and then I'm gonna talk about Sabbath or rest or taking mm -hmm. a regular break. Because I think part of why we collapse hmm. is because we have not let ourselves rest. We've been like going, 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 and we finish the story and then we just like collapse into a puddle at the end. Hmm. And one of the ways to avoid this is a Sabbath of some sort. Um, and so for me, that means one day a week when I do not write at all. Hmm. And that may sound like um, losing momentum. But it actually, it's a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. And so because I decided what day Sabbath is, for me right now, it changes depending on my life and schedule. For me right now, it's Saturday. Mm. And so Saturday only Saturday gets a green check if I don't write that day. That is oh. success. That is success because it's me keeping myself healthy and going to finish the story. Um, it gets a red X if I write that day. Um, because then I, I have, I have done, you know, I'm, I am not taking care of myself and it's, it's going to like, I'm going to unravel as if I keep doing that, if I just write day after day, after day, after day for a long period of time, then yes, I will absolutely collapse at the end. But if, if I keep Sabbath as part of my success, green deck, if I don't write red, mm -hmm. if I do, mm -hmm. um, then when I get to the end, I don't feel like I need to collapse. You know, um, I, f I feel like I've made it and I feel like it's been difficult, uh, but I don't feel run down or I don't feel burned out. I don't feel exhausted um, mm. uh, because I've been just turning that little relief valve every week and mm. letting off the pressure. Um, mm. So I don't know. The, those could sound like they're contradictory, but they're not. Like keep your momentum going. And one of the ways you keep your momentum is by resting on a regular basis so that you can that's that's where this that's how you get stamina stamina doesn't come from willpower which is just like i have decided i want to keep going so i will um that that always breaks down uh stamina comes from resting and conditioning <laughs> and that's <laughs> writing six days in a row is conditioning and doing that week after week after week after week and and momentum that is like i said that's how you become a better writer every single day you get conditioned it becomes easier lifting to do this thing uh, but at the same time, um, you, you've got to take care of yourself because you won't get, you won't have stamina if you're just, if you run yourself at, at maximum speed all the time. Absolutely. It's almost like the concept of uh, renewal, right? Like renewal is a process wherein you're not doing nothing, you're renewing, <laughs> right? Like, uh, and, and so it's, if you did, if you did three Sabbaths days per week, well, then you might lose your momentum because those two days you didn't need. But the one day of renewal was actually necessary for you to kind of reset your system and be able to be able to keep the momentum for the other six days. Um, I like that a lot. The uh, The only thing that I would add to what to what you were talking about, and I, did, uh, I have finished two novels now um, because Death of a Bounty Hunter is about to come out. And the first novel... Um, and, and a novel is different than a short film because the short film's has its own differences of how you finish it and what it looks like and things like that. But the, the two novels, the first novel I did not have, I had maybe more of a traditional, those five emotions that you talked about. Those, those were kind of more of my feeling. Um, I'm really bad at celebrating. So uh, I need to buy cupcakes because that sounds awesome. Um, the second novel, one thing that I realized that was, that has happened to me after writing it was it's a much more personal story um, in terms of my observation of the world, my observation of my place in the world, um, me, the problems that the, the characters are facing in Death of a Bounty Hunter are similar to some of the ways that I feel about the problems that I'm facing in my own life um, from, a, from a big esoteric worldview level, but also from a very specific uh, behavioral level as well. Um, obviously, the character does something in the story that I have not done, but I'm just saying that that same sort of like dealing with what I would call your imperfection or your sin nature, if you want to lean towards more of a religious term, 
And one of the things I realized about finishing this one is that those five, those five uh, emotions, not that they're not present, I'm not saying that, but they're accompanied by a new one that is the story has ended, but it doesn't feel like from the worldview perspective that any resolution has happened. And from a, my personal experience perspective that, that any sort of resolution has happened. And it's because the thing, well, I already talked about what the story is addressing because it talked about leaving before you leave your gift at the altar, make sure you're reconciled to the verse says brother, but it means, you know, sister, brother, anybody in neighbors, anyone else that you need to be reconciled to. Um, and, and I think that that, that has been an interesting conclusion to the story because it doesn't conclude in, in real life. It doesn't end in real life. It doesn't. And, and of course the way that it ends in death of a bounty hunter too, is not the antithesis of that. Um, and I'm trying not to spoil anything, but um, what it does do though, is it, is it, is it, it creates this, sense of I've reflected real life, hopefully for people, I have presented solutions to problems, hopefully, but also I have to carry probably the closest thing to it would be the grief emotion. I have to carry the fact that that still exists in the world, right? Like this is, it's, it's, it is literally mm -hmm. what we talked about earlier with our, um, with, with your, uh, what did you, wait, what's the term you used? Your, your, you, uh, was, it, was it language of lament or? Yes, language of lament, yeah. yes. And so it's the language of lament for me as a writer is knowing that if I write about a weighty topic that I feel like I understand from multiple perspectives and I put that into a book and the complications of that continue in the world, um, there's a certain part of that where you're not grieving. I'm not grieving the, the fact that I'm not writing the book anymore. I'm, I'm happy that it's done but I'm grieving the fact that the things I was writing about are there, there's, you know, the end of, um, I believe it's Munich, the end of Munich where the guy says to his handler, um, he goes, well, there's just going to be more terrorists. What are we doing here? And then the guy says, well, it's like cutting your fingernails. They keep growing back, but you have to keep cutting them. Um, and that's sort of the feeling I get as the end of death of a bounty hunter is that this problem still is, exists in the world and we're going to have to still address it all the time, but it, it never is going to magically disappear. And so with that, how do you, you know, it, 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 it's, it's so, it becomes so personal to you that you're like, well, I can't let it go. Um, <laughs> the other, the one other thing I'll say before we close it out um, is that I also think that once you've reached the end of your story, I think that in 2020, it's really important to go back, especially if you are self-publishing or if you are releasing these things to the world without having other, my wife edits my stories and she's awesome editor, so it's perfect. But if you're not having other people give you feedback along the way or something, but even if you are, uh, reflect on what it is that you did that was good and then ignore or discount all of the people who will come into your life to tell you that it wasn't good enough for them. Because A, they might not be the audience. And so don't let them rain on your parade. The, you just, the audience that loved it is the audience that was important to you. Um, the people who had issues with your technique, I had these people like legitimately, we, we, in time slingers, we did a technique that we really liked and we did it intentionally. And I've had people criticize the technique and it's like, well, I did that intentionally because I thought it was good. And so for me, as I give a give out to writers, some advice on where you'll be at the end of what you're creating recognize what was good, recognize why you put it in there as being good, recognize what was bad too. It's fine to recognize what was bad. That's not a problem. But as other people come in to critique you, take it with a grain of salt, because if you respect people that are critiquing you, use that to get better. Otherwise, if it's just the general populace that has no knowledge of what went into it and no knowledge of what you were trying to accomplish, reflect what you know is good and don't worry about, don't worry about It'd be, it'd be like me saying, don't worry about the haters. <laughs> it would be the, <laughs> the meme version of what I'm saying. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any um, other final final thoughts? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Just as you were talking, two more things occurred to me to sort ah. of about the... Um, so one is emotional distance. Mm. Part of why it's important to celebrate your victory when you've completed the story is because it will never be more exciting for you than right then. 
Mm. Um, uh, an example, uh, the, the film that I co-wrote, The Mongolian Connection, just came out in August, August 2020. I wrote, um, I worked on it, wrote most of those scenes in 2017 and a little bit in 2018. So for me, even though everyone around me is seeing the movie for the first time, for me, it is a memory. Yeah. And yeah. so you, you, there's, there's this phenomenon that happens where something is a current event, but it's also for you, it's, pa- it's in the past. Mm. I emotionally, I am many other, many more stories <laughs> down the road. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I've gone through the cycle, with probably five other stories since then. <laughs> right. And so it's, it's not that I, it's not that I don't love it and I don't love seeing people react to it. I don't love having it in the world and being able to show people to it. But it is also, all of that is tempered by the fact that to me, it really kind of happened three years ago. And, mm-hmm. um, and that's why it's really important to celebrate when you finish, because that is going to be the freshest moment mm-hmm. of victory. Sometimes we will defer our celebration because we're like, oh, I'll be excited when it comes out. But especially with things like films that take years, like you, you won't feel the same way. Yeah. Um, you, you will feel differently. It will, it's still a pleasant sensation. Mm-hmm. It's it's like a nice memory, and it's and and what is happening in the in the present is is wonderful, and you enjoy that. But it's not the same as having just succeeded. Mm-hmm. Um, so that distance, you, you're you're you'll experience it. You know, I experience it. Um, even just w- like working on a comic series, the issue that comes out that week, you're already writing two issues later. You know what I mean, or right. even three issues later. And so it's something to you, it's a past event. And it's not just a past event um, theoretically. Mm. It's a past event in that you are you are actually sixty pages further in the story. Right. You know what I mean. Um, you are. It is, it is the past of what you are doing that day, and mm. the next day, and the day after. Um, uh, and so, there will be distance, mm. and um, and it's it's actually it the distance itself can be pleasant if that makes mm. any sense. Mm. Um, there's almost some nostalgia to it. Mm. And then also it, it enables you to sort of ignore the haters. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Cause, cause yeah. to you, it's not just like, it's not like I just, I just slit my wrist and poured my blood onto the page. You're right. like, I did do that, but I did that three years ago. Yeah. And <laughs> like, right. you, like you just, you have a different perspective. And so yes. when people re- respond to it in a way that you weren't hoping back then when you finished, it's not that you're hoping for them to respond to it that way. Now it just doesn't mean as much to you because you're, mm. like, you're like, yeah, they didn't like that story, but you know, what? I've written five since then, yeah. and uh, I feel like I've kept getting better. And maybe they'll like this. One. Um, it you know, it just gives you a different context uh, for all of those experiences. And then uh, the other thing I'd say that I like to do this probably should have gone under technique is every time mm. I finish a story, I try to pick one thing that I want to do better in the next story at. Uh, uh, nice. And it's not that it's not that I think I did a bad necessarily that I think I did a bad job of it here, mm. but it's just so like I think I did the best job of this that I was capable of this week in mm. this story. But two months from now, when I've been writing for eight more weeks and I've gotten that much better as a writer, I, I actually think maybe I can do even a little better at this. And mm. so I'm always trying to just just to improve at least at one thing. You're growing in all areas. You will be. But it just it keeps me conscious and, and I can look at that and say, you know what, I do think I pulled that off a little better in this story than in the last story. And it makes you feel like things are going somewhere, even when scripts aren't selling or when it takes five years for something to happen. Um, it can be easy to feel like nothing is going anywhere. Mm. But when you when you are able to see this string of pearls of like, yep, I, I did that well here. But you know what? I did a little better here. And mm. then I, and then there's something I'd liked that, that I did in that script, but I wanted to do it a little better there. And I did it, you know, um, when I was very young, I read a book by Orson Scott Card called uh, How to Write Fantasy and Science Fiction, something to, mm. uh, to that effect. And there was a statement in there that has stayed with me to this day. And that was write today's best story today and tomorrow's best story tomorrow. Um, you know, and that was his way of saying like, don't keep rewriting the same thing for, for you know, for 40 years. Like, write it, make it as good as you can right now, 
and then send it out into the world and start something else. And you'll get, you'll be a little better at that one at tomorrow's story mm-hmm. than you are today's. Um, uh, but, you, but the reason you'll be better is because you have finished this one, put it out in the world and start it again on something else. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So pick one thing you'd like to get better at and just be aware of that weird emotional distance thing that's going to happen to you. <laughs> yeah. I love it. That's awesome. That's really great. Uh, any other final thoughts or we've done, we've done uh, a lot? No, I don't think. Uh, thank you for sticking with us for an hour and 40 minutes uh, compared to our regular hour. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. To anyone who's listened this far, uh, my only <laughs> final thought is gratitude. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. I hope, you, seriously. I hope that you learned something. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope so too. Or or at least that you have thought about things in a different way. That's, that, that's if, when you're talking about podcasting, as long as we can get you to prompt to think about something in a different way than we've done our jobs. Um, just a couple of, uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, we will, for the rest of 2020, um, Caleb and I will still be live every other Friday at 2 PM. But as we transition into 2021, our schedules are going to change quite a bit. And it looks like we haven't necessarily landed on this yet. So, so stay tuned to future episodes. We'll give you more details, but it looks like we're actually going to be live on Monday for, for people on the West coast. It'll be live on Monday morning at 9 a.m. because uh, Caleb will be in a different area of the world. So we have to get our, our time synced up there. Um, so for 2021, stay tuned for a new time. And the other thing I wanted to just announce to everybody is I've had several people say, hey, look, I'd love to listen to this podcast, but it's only on YouTube and I want to carry it around with me and like do chores while I'm listening. And uh, this podcast, the Impactful Writing Podcast, will be published under the Story Geeks podcast feed also starting in 2021. So make sure you're subscribed over to the Story Geeks podcast. They will still be doing their uh, normal episodes, um, which go deep into pop culture stories um, and science fiction, fantasy, and comic book stories. So Caleb and I's podcast will just augment what's already there with writers' perspectives on a lot of these things. Um, I am going to leave one question for everybody out there who is watching or listening, and you can go into the comments and let us know. But I want to know what some of your favorite endings in your favorite stories are. So let us know in the comments down below. Do not forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Um, Support Caleb. Caleb, where can people find you? CalebMonroe.com. CalebMonroe.com. And and you can find the Mongolian Connection on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon. Yeah, you got to go watch it because I got to go watch it because I keep saying I'm going to watch it. And then every time I forget in the process to do it. And the problem is, is that like I legitimately want to do it. But this is what noise does in your life. Noise keeps hitting you with all the other things you need to watch. And you're like, okay, wait a minute. So I need to watch that for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I for me, I'll just say this is another another sort of emotional way that I process things. For me, the, the victory is that it's in the world and people can watch it. It's yeah. not, it's not that people have watched it, mm. if that makes any sense. Sure, like, sure. I'm excited every time someone has seen it, yeah. but I, for me, the particular delight is that at any point, anyone can see it. And yeah, those are slightly different, but yeah. Yeah. And it's also, you and I talk about this a lot and we should have a whole episode dedicated to this, but as a writer producer, how do you think differently about things than you do as a, just a writer? Right. Because like, as you say that, I think to myself, oh, that would be so nice. But I have to worry <laughs> I have to worry about, like, getting the thing out there and, like, having people actually, you know, if I, I mean, not that I, not, I could not have people listen to it and it'd be fine. Um, but it's, y- y- there are different, the milestones are all, almost different. So we should do, like, mm-hmm. a milestones for different kinds of creatives. That'd be really fun, actually. We could get yeah. some great guests on that. That would be too. great. All right. Well, keep telling. Well, and keep- also, Jay didn't say this. But I'm going to remind everyone, Death of a Bounty Hunter, the first first audio chapter comes out Monday. Yep, the first two. The first two first audio two, chapters sorry. come out on Monday. No, 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 you're, 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 you're good. We <laughs> wanted to release two at the same time because, because we have different narrators and because those are actually different actors acting out the narration, we have three. But in the first two chapters, we wanted to show people what the difference was like between the first two narrators. But yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I would love for you to go um, check out Death of a Bounty Hunter. In fact... This weekend, if you hit up the website, um, we should have the... I've already done an intro 
and you can actually subscribe to the RSS feed. There is a free RSS feed where you can get the first 12 chapters for free. Obviously, we'd love for you to support us by buying it, but there are 40 chapters. So you can subscribe to the first 12 and decide whether or not you like it, and then you can support us and purchase it after that. But yeah, deathofabountyhunter.com is where you can get all that information. And it is it is live now, so you can go check that out right now. And then the first two chapters will be uploaded on November 9th, which is Monday. Um, in fact, I just got an email as we were doing this show that my sound engineer said, here are the... Here are the two chapters finally done, <laughs> uh, so, which is great. So that's awesome. So definitely check that out. Thank you for mentioning it, Caleb. And in the meantime, keep telling deep, meaningful stories, and we will see you on the next show. Bye. See you soon. <laughs>